Ich schon Bock. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so my pleasure to tell you a little bit about my research. I, I I'm doing many different things, but one of the big bits of my research program was focused on jets recently. So that's what I'm going to tell about. Um, okay, it's working. Um, for a very long time, like now, we as bigger community, we are always going somehow deeper and deeper into the matter to more and more elementary constituents. And it's quite successful path. So like say QCD uh, nicely describes uh, collider experiments for proton-proton collisions. It's like we have precision tool for that. But describing this laptop I'm using for my table with uh, uh, first principle uh, field theory is kind of hard. Uh, so this path back to the matter around us is very complicated. Um, fortunately, we can make some first steps towards that. And uh, one option is to look at bigger colliding systems, to collide nuclei instead of um, atoms. Um, when we collide nuclei, the idea is simple. We have uh, higher multiplicity, we have high energy density, so we should melt uh, our hadrons to quarks and gluons, and this partonic soup should uh, hopefully, uh, show some collectivity. So we we want to get uh, a matter. Some and in fact, we do get some collective matter. And in some sense, this is the simplest complex uh, matter we can um, get experimentally too. And it's uh, something we may have some hope to describe using QCD. Um, moreover, we can in principle try to um, handle the size of this system, so we can try to go uh, and prop smaller. Uh, droplets of this matter, trying to see how uh, separate elementary particles or like some ensemble of elementary particles become collective. Um, it is a reasonable step towards the real matter around us. Um, and then this matter is produced somewhere deep in the collider, so you cannot just uh, put their spoon and uh, touch it, so you need to send something through, somehow probe it. Um, fortunately, uh, people spent some time and came up with uh, smart ideas on how to probe these systems. And uh, most of them based on the following, that in the initial moment of collision, um, the, 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 there are particles of higher energy, which usually called hard props. And these <clears throat> higher energetic, pa usually partons, they go through the matter, and then you can have some hope to, to, to understand something about uh, the matter looking at these partons. Um, large fraction of these partons end up in the form of, um, let's move it actually this side. Uh, and up in the form of jets, so collimated sprays of hadrons in the final state. People do see them, and uh, quickly people came up with the idea of uh, something called jet tomography. So can we use jets to uh, reconstruct some details about the structure and the evolu time evolution of this uh, uh, collective matter producing heavy ion collisions? And uh, the simple answer is uh, yes. So people, in an experiment, people do see uh, for instance, energy suppression of jets. So the pair of so pairs of jets, which are produced essentially in the same hard scattering, uh, they have different energy going out of the matter. So this, this is called junk quenching. And this is one of the first uh, evidences of the matter production, so of the collectivity in heavy ion collisions. Uh, and uh, coming to this business from my side, and I'm coming not from hard prop side. So somehow historically I was doing much more transport and matter evolution things. So I trying to figure out how the thing's working, uh, I try to ask the following question, like, would such a jet uh, feel the flow? It's like very nature, right? If I'm going to do a tomogra tomographic study, I want to learn something about evolution, what can be simpler? Can I see some effect of the local flow? Uh, and the simple answer is yes, because of the jet generally produces some arbitrary point inside the fireball, and then it's going in some arbitrary direction, so it on general see sees some flow around over its path. Um, and uh, general intuition tells that it should uh, see that um, let's try to do something much simpler than jet. Let's try to think about, I know, a stone in water. If I take a stone um, and plug it into water and try to pull it with constant speed, there will be dissipative force trying to prevent this motion, so I will have to exert force on it. It's usually called drag force. And on general grounds, I can say that it will scale with temperature, it will be proportional to velocity, and then uh, the microscopic details of interactions between my stone or any other kind of impurity in my matter, it will sit in front of this guy. So then you go, have to go to microscopics. But this answer is like hydrodynamic level answer. So symmetries and uh, dimensional analysis. And then again, 
more or less at the same level if I assume that my matter has some changing parameters, say density, there would be a force exerted on impurity on very general grounds. So I do expect that there would be force proportional to the extent of that density. And in fact, and in fact, uh, years ago when I was in my grad school uh, with my supervisor Krishna, we were looking into the um, uh, drag force as a uh, proxy for energy loss in holographic plasmas. Holography is a very nice uh, playground because if you can uh, you can do microscopics without um, in, in the same framework with all your hydrodynamics all together. It's very nice. And we looked there and indeed the drag force, force gains uh, such corrections. So the general expectation then is like, whenever I have a probe in my matter, my matter is flowing, so the probe will see the flow. When my matter has structure, the probe will see the gradients. And now with this general intuition, I, I want to go to jets. And uh, that is practical issue. To describe jets, the microscopics uh, are very complicated. In, it's very easy to understand the idea is like, I, I, I want to study a scattering problem, problem of some particle over an, uh, a matter. So the matter is usually described in very different domain of theories than scattering processes. Uh, historically, people came up with this idea, it's goes, uh, it goes back to Landau time, uh, that you can replace matter with collective fields, which are stochastic, and then th 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 these fields are your mo matter model, and all the other processes are in the field theory, so you can study the interaction of probes with matter in this manner. And until these days, it's the main, it's the main approach, at least field theory approach. There are no other uh, first principle approaches. And it goes back in our field to these guys here. Uh, the, the typical tool is called BDMPSZ, uh, and it's uh, what people actually used to uh, try to get some estimates for experimental observables in reality. Also, I should make a remark here. So heavy ion collisions, they produce very complicated system. So you cannot just calculate something and compare it to experiment. So all the theories should be shredded through some simulations. Usually, they simplify theory a lot, and then they are quite involved by themselves. And only then you can compare to something realistic. So however, it's uh, definitely what we should do. We should improve the theory to make this thing working. And then when I came to that idea, I wanted to just say, oh, this field should take into account that my matter is moving. Why not to do that? And I faced first uh, uh, practical issue. Uh, until very recently, uh, the community was mainly divided into two branches. People doing jet quenching, they were usually looking at a brick of plasma, which was static at best with some structure along the jet path. And this structure is easy to take into account, but transversely, it was like just a brick. And on the matter side, people doing very complicated, crazily complicated simulations, starting from some classical fields, seizing the initial non-equilibrium dynamics and heavy ion collisions. Then they use kinetic theory to describe this non-equilibrium dynamics. Then they see hydrodynamic sim <clears throat> simulations, which uh, bring you to hadronization stage, and you look at the hadron gas. So this is very sophisticated modeling, but these people usually don't take into account jets and don't look at them. And jet people usually have no matter. And then if you want to go further and try to probe matter formation in smaller systems, this is actually, uh, uh, right now, it is our uh, puzzle in the field. So people see collectivity in uh, colliding smaller systems, not nucleus-nucleus uh, systems, but more like nucleus-proton uh, systems. They see collectivity in the soft sector. They see that this matter produces it kind, it kind of uh, flowing. Um, but uh, it, it, they don't see jet quenching. So it's very interesting to understand what happens with jets in this system. But even before that, you want to go to an equilibrium systems, which should fluctuate and flow. And even that is not possible, like, at least wasn't possible. And then the idea was very simple. So when I came to this business, I wanted to go from that side to that side. So on that side, my jet goes through matter. It interacts with matter in somewhat sophisticated way, but uh, pretty accessible. I replace my matter by some stochastic collective color sources. And they, before, were having structure only along the path of the jet, and they were not moving. They were essentially static uh, in the matter earth frame. And now I want to allow them to flow. I want to allow them to fluctuate. I want to have transfer structure. I want, in principle, the jet to back react on the matter. Um, and I started there in 2000. Uh, in 2020, essentially, 2019. And this is a set of works where we are trying to address all these issues. 
I think it will double over the coming year or two, and then we will close the theoretical uh, part of that path. So what was there before just were good to try to do X-ray of our plasma, but the theory was oversimplified. In these works, we put there the flow, we put their transfer structure. We started putting their fluctuations. This is not yet fully finished. So just yet, not yet properly coupled on fluctuating non-equilibrium matter. We studied the transport uh, evolution equation, which is usually used for all the phenol uh, considerations for jets when people model them. And now, in principle, when this bit is closed, we should go to real observables and try to couple the theory to simulations. That's what we are talking with our uh, numerical friends. We're trying to convince them that they should take our new theory, developed theory, and modify their codes with it, which is not easy, generally. So now I'm going to illustrate, in most simple cases, the kind of algebra uh, entering this business. So my matter is made of some color sources. I will assume that they are classical, so they have... Sorry, Henry, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Can I ask a question? So. If you go maybe back one slide. So in the, what uh, uh, quantity in principle are we computing to describe uh, the jets? What's the observable that we are, that we would like to compute? Is it some energy correlator or uh, so, so, exactly so, so, be the observable that ideally we would like to compute just to translate those so, pictures into a sharp formula? The, 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 the theorist on the theory side usually produce uh, final distributions of partons either broadening or gluon emission. So you want to know how the partons after some number of emissions distributed in the phase space. And then you can evaluate these distributions with uh, something to obtain what you think. So for instance, uh, say, right in this work, we were trying to play with energy-energy correlators. So we can compute energy-energy correlators. It's oversimplified computation. So what people do for energy-energy correlators is much, much oversimplified if you want to compare to experiment. But you can do it. And actually, you see, the, I, somehow I should um, make it clear here. What I'm more interested in the theory, but the issue of all this business that theory is very primitive. It's not fully developed yet. So this, this field is uh, experiment driven and then model driven. That's why what I want, I want to find general phenomena which will have imprint and then no matter what happens with theory, they will stay there. So I'm using the theory which is there, but however, I have to say that this theory which I'm using and all the people using is oversimplified. Now, the ideal things usually look like, say, jet shapes, so-called jet angularities. That is jet shape, jet gears, jet mass. Then more recently, people were looking at energy and that's true. However, I have big questions to what um, they can actually calculate with given the theory they use. Okay, actually, we'll show you a slide and a point, point, particular issue. Okay, so Thank you. now at the simplest level, my method I think is made... there is a question. There is a question by Rogério. Ah, sure. Yeah, uh, so Andre, just a quick question. So, uh, your calculations are all in the model, are all perturbative? Is that in, the, in, in this business, they are. They are perturbative in some particular way because if I'm in matter, I'm not perturbing in coupling. I'm perturbing in something called opacity. It's a combination of coupling, the density of these guys, depending on, as often in many body theories, the um, perturbative parameter depends on the densities and the mean free paths. Okay. However, I can resum these results. So it's on one hand perturbative. It's perturbative QCD. It's not, uh, I don't know, holography or lattice calculation. Uh, but it goes beyond the given order and perturbation theory. But it's a partial resummation, which is phenomenology driven. Okay, so there, is, there are scaling arguments why you can resum this way, uh, but uh, it's just it's not unexplored. People have only this argument why they resum, uh, you know, ladder diagrams and don't put their other things. I will show okay. it in a second. I will show it in a second. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So I will, this this essentially describes the matter model. Okay. So I have my color sources. I will assume that they are classical. I uh, don't care about spins, so they are scalars at the moment because of the spin effects highly suppressed by the energy of, you know, like, of the interacting object. And my jets are energetic. Um, and then I will have to put there some potential. Here I'm showing a particular model, which is called Julassi one potential. Uh, the idea is that the gluons inside matter, they are screened, so you want to have something like D by mass. 
but this object is uh, different and most of my considerations are quite agnostic about what will stand, sit here. And then the, all my sources, they have some color or charge, which is stochastic. So this field is stochastic. Now, I will keep the momentum of these guys and I will assume that the properties of matter may change from point to point, but the, the sources are far away from each other. So I can look at the local properties, not modifying uh, the very uh, the very form, say, of the potential. It's so already... just, a, just a quick question. Is there any issue with gauge in this calculation? Historically, the people had some practical issues, but uh, right now, in what I am doing, I think the problem is, at least at this level, is solved. Uh, you can it's it's fixed gauge calculation. So you do you do field theory and fixed gauge calculation. The problem was that when you want to expand and large energy of the part, and this is my part, which will interact with my matter. You, it's and you want to look at emissions. So it's some gluons going out of this uh, upper line. You want to use different gauge in the matter interaction and emissions to make it simply uh, simplifying, but in, in principle, you don't need to do that. And since I already complicate my consideration by looking at sub A canal, one over energy of the part and corrections, I don't have this issue. I just do it in the same gauge. And the boss pitch. Um, okay, so I will assume that my part is, uh, my, uh, that is essentially classical current, it's heavy, it has velocity, so it sits here and modifies the energy transfer. And I have an entropy of my matter which sits in this sum, if you wish. So the, all the properties change. And this potential is what I was showing. The Julasi Wank is the model, uh, but I will have in mind, but in principle, I can plug here anything. There are two or three or four options people use for phenomenology, and I want to stay agnostic. Also, it would be abuse of the model if you try to uh, probe the features of this thing. Now, in this business, people are interested in ensembles. So it's not asymptotic state going into matter. It's some ensemble, a wave packet produced by Sour J. Uh, and this source will be modeled with something. So you want to think how initial distribution defined by J is shredded through your matter and what you get in the final state. So I will plug these things there. And then after I get the amplitude, I square it, I get some distribution, I have to average because of my fields are stochastic. I don't have control over a single uh, event in heavy ion collision, so I have to average. And the usual averaging is just Gaussian averaging. So they are averaged in like this white noise, only two point functions. It's also often called color neutrality if you look in this literature. And I will assume that there are sufficiently many sorts, so I will do things in smooth approximations. So I will integrate over number density of these guys. If you, in fact, if you ever closely followed <clears throat> color glass condensate and small X style calculations in QCD. I think, uh, Dario has a question. Dario, I think uh, Andre will not see you. So I think people should just ask questions when they have questions. Okay. Uh, do the results uh, are, let's say, highly dependent on these uh, Gaussianic assumptions or, uh, I mean... Um... Um, there, there are two, two, two statements here. First, going beyond Gaussian, you can try to do that in QCD and you will see that those things are perturbatively suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing, yes, it would depend on an ongoing show and it's a small corrections and it's interesting to study. And um, this formalism for jets is very similar to what people do in small XQCD. It's, I think, historically either coming from the same point or one similarly, like, you no, know, faking the other. And um, people in small X physics try to look to non Gaussian contributions mm -hmm. and they quickly got stuck. I see. So, but do again, you have any, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm just mumbling. Do you have any, let's say, central limit theorem like thing that you can say? Do you have some? No, this, this this field is very simplistic on the theory side. People assume assume these things on general grounds. They say the ma the main idea is that you just say that when something goes through your, your event, and you will have some over many events. The first thing we should average out is color because it's the fastest absorbable. Okay, F not absorbable, but fast fastest um, parameter locally. Mm -hmm. um, what you what you want to ask is like whether it's possible to prove. I don't think every anybody will be able to tell you on the serious side. They will say, oh, it looks like it's working. I see. So what I want to do eventually, I want to look at how jets couple to non-equilibrium matter, and then it will break. Then it will break inevitably, and that's what I want to take a look at in the next uh, one, two, three years. Uh, 
And that's theoretical, it's much more interesting. But the question is, you see, the problem will be, I probably will be able to do that. It will cost me a year, a year of time. And then when you bring it to people doing the um, uh, phenomenology, they will say that the effects is, too, is way too small to even discuss it with this experiment. I see. So that's somehow experiment driven field. So I'm doing these things carefully, mm -hmm. um, uh, not to overdo it. Okay. So now I will square average. Yeah, feel, feel, please feel free to, to, to ask questions. I just don't open it. Otherwise, I will hide half of my slides. Um, mm -hmm. So if I draw it in QCD style or like in a field theory style, so there is a branch cut and the amplitude on the left and right of branch cut, um, what usually happens, I have two integrals over the momentum here and here. But then when I will average over the density of the sources of these guys, I the, in literature, people say, oh, nothing depends on this transverse coordinate. So in integrating over it, I get delta of this momentum. So I say that the momentum exchange is equal. And the plus here would mean that the branch cut is moved beyond the second interaction. However, in reality, I have a density of the sources here, which would scale with temperature. And naturally, there are corrections. And this correction is completely excluded. OK, we are excluded before our works. So we put them back. And since it's all uh, so far about hydrophase, about the quark-gluon plasma phase, we allowed ourselves to expand in gradients. If you expand on gradients, you will put here powers of coordinates, so it will get you delta functional derivatives. Those are tractable, but it's a very different correction to this guy. So it's not like anymore two to two scattering square. It's uh, many to many with uh, extra kick on one of the sides due to the gradient. Okay. Now, if I focus on anisotropy behind this uh, picture, that is anisotropy. So I turn off the velocity. Uh, just as illustration. What will happen, I take my part and produced by some source. I allow it to interact many times. That's what I was uh, mentioning before, that in this uh, field, people expand a number of interactions sometimes. But designing many interactions is easy. However, there is a very strong assumption that this coupling here is different from this coupling here. So people want to stay perturbative in the coupling here. OK? And they assume that everything else is integrated out. So this is the ultimate interaction with matter. Um, perturbatively, you may want to draw some other diagrams, modifying the vertex, modifying the current. Uh, but usually, you expect that those will have extra powers of coupling. So people just disregard them. Also, this calculation is already um, quite complicated, especially for you know phenom motivated people. So however, when I do that, even for many of them, I easily resum it. It's a simple letter diagram. I'm working in large en energy limits, so I can resum it as in essentially two plus one dimensional quantum mechanics. So this guy is an auxiliary single particle propagator. And I assume that my matter is sufficiently diluted so I can disregard the poles of my model potential. People want to pick up this pulse eventually, but it would be an abuse of model because of if you want to do that, you need to really embed this consideration into something like hard thermal loops. And in this business, the poles of this guy are physical. And um, it seems there is some tension. So you, essentially, you don't want to go far beyond this limit. OK, so if you do that, this is a propagator. You see simple 2 plus 1 dimensional quantum me mechanics for a massive particle with energy E. And this is essentially the Wilson line, right? Um, I square this guy, and then I will face uh, something very simple, an uh, average of two pass ordered exponentials. Fortunately, such, such product averaged can be exponentiated back. So if I have no gradients, so forget about this blue part for a moment, I will get just this guy, which is I give here. It's very commonly, it's commonly appearing in this business. It's called dipole potential. It is the quantity made of these poten elementary potentials, which controls all the jet processes. Uh, both let, me ask, uh, let me ask one question, please. So I'm a bit confused. It's the second time this appears in the slides. About these averages being done uh, before computing the observable itself. Shouldn't I compute the observable many times and then average? Or, or is this what you are doing, actually? It's essentially what I'm doing. You can, you, I'm computing the final distributions, and then any observable can be computed over, over, over the final distribution. Your any observable you can, in principle, compute. Okay, at least at the current stages of what people do. I don't know, not what I mean. You you may worry about some field theory effects, but it's. I mean, if you do what people do, 
you first compute distribution, say, of gluons, and then you ask where energy or momentum flows. Okay, so this average will give me some kernel entering the final distribution of gluons over many events, and then I will calculate any observable out of this distribution. I will illustrate in a second. I will illustrate it in a second. So, so let me just make sure I understand. So in you, in this disorder business, for example, we should first compute and then average over disorder, right? Not make the disorder dynamical. Yes, but here but... Aren't we making aren't we making this gluons dynamical? This average of the gluons no, dynamical. No, no. It's, no? it's, it's, it's just that is so the the, the the phenomenology of this business is somewhat motivated by QCD style factorization. So people usually assume that anything they want to compute will factorize. So I can easily come up with an object which wouldn't allow you to average before and uh, before computing it completely. But the objects like jet shape, they compute it from exactly this, they define this way. They compute it from these final state part and distributions, which and, and that, then it doesn't matter whether you average before or after. The average just goes through all the integrals. So they 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 commuting. So coming well, to uh, let's say terminology that I'm familiar with, essentially you are doing a in a near average rather, rather than quench. And you say that for your observables, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I, I can I can show you why. It's uh, because of the mm -hmm. observables, again, the, you should understand that the observables here are very simplistic. Uh, the simplest thing you can actually calculate, they are nearly unmeasurable. So people were trying to measure them for 30 years and failed. By failed, I mean they, 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 they can uh, describe their data with simulations where the parameters can change by one or two orders of magnitude. So they cannot extract things. And then there are groups of people who manage to describe different experimentally accessible objects, fixing parameters with, you know, with small error bars. But mm -hmm. now they don't necessarily agree between each other. And it seems that there are many ways to do that, tweaking here or there, okay? Uh, and that's why it's very hard to go from theory to experiment. So it's it's hard to say what is the right assumption. However, what I okay, let me let me let me show you a few more slides, and then I will show you the first typical uh, object people discuss. So I average this object. I managed to exponentiate it without gradients. Now in our work, we managed to it's the first order gradients. I put it in exponential, but you should understand that it's, it's expansion in this uh, G, and G is the thing where I put all the gradients together. In my business, I raise density of these guys and Debye mass. So all of them will boil down to gradients of temperature. Um, before it was depending only on the difference of positions of these guys. Now there is some center of mass position. It goes through, there is pass integral. I still can treat it. Uh, it's sufficiently simple, but definitely much easier to treat when there is of diagonal uh, kinetic term and uh, the potential depends only on one of coordinates. Now it's not the case, but still. Um, Easy. And when I do that, I come exactly to the typical discussion of observables. I say I have some initial distribution. People, for instance, often like to look at the just ensemble of partons flying in the, say, Z direction, let's call it Z direction, uh, with no transverse momentum at the initial moment. You see, there is some energy distribution, but I don't care about it at the moment. Then I shredder it through my machinery, which I written here as a simple formula, but it's some complicated object which would fit uh, probably one slide, but in a smaller font. I will get the final distribution of my partons in transverse momentum. And now this distribution, which is still slightly ugly, uh, should be used to, uh, to say something like, what is average transverse momentum of parton going out of plasma? It was the first object people wanted to study in this business and it's called jet quenching parameter, this Q hat. Is the famous Q had people often discussing in this business. So they discuss uh, what is the average momentum of ensemble of, of partons of jet essentially. Um, after it going through matter, they average it and they look at this Q hat, which would be you know uh, distance derivative, the past distance derivative of this thing. So now going back to the question about uh, how I average, you see this kind of uh, the observables, they don't care about. Um, okay, sorry. This averaging is a bit different from the previous averaging. This averaging is just integral of this guy with the right power of p. That's I should be more careful of these uh, brackets. But the averaging over different events doesn't care about weighting my final distribution with some power of momentum. It's just extra momentum integral which can be pulled out. 
and all but the what observers. About, what, what about uh, normally the issue is about one over z, right? The partition function. If you average or not one over z, so it's not just you don't just multiply, you normalize and. No, 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 no. In, inside matter, that's as far as people go. Otherwise, you will basically disregard all the developments in matter. People still cannot do um, uh, the, the judge shapes at the level of vacuum, where they really discuss um, some quantum field theory features. So here they just discuss, well, like, my partners fly out of matter uh, and they distribute momentum this way. What uh, happens with, say, energy flow? This is state of wouldn't you say the same in any statistical mechanical problem? I want to compute expectation value of some spin square. I just sum the spin and then I average and it doesn't matter if I put spin or not, but it does because there is one over partition function, right? Um, not, not no, he, 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 here, here it wouldn't because of... Um, okay, first you can see it explicitly by just uh, calculating this guy. So this object before you, before averaging and after averaging will uh, the, the, the very way how you average it will go through the momentum integra integrals. So is it, maybe, I, is, it maybe, the... is it maybe because it's a small effect and it's perturbation theory and therefore you no, are no 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 here here, here no. it's raised as a as a, as a consequence of some inbuilt assumption about uh, the dynamics. I cannot tell you right away why it happens this uh, this way and not as in general statmec. I understand the effect you're referring to. Um, I never never in detail thought why it's this way. But I think just when people were building this model initially, they wanted to avoid this problem. And since it was a very crude model, they just made it this way. Yeah. So meaning, meaning if we go to what we, we were discussing some slides ago, to non to non Gaussian uh, uh, average, then I will have all the, these issues. Then I will have to worry about how I do averaging. So um, this is typical jet quenching parameter. Now, if I go back to what I was doing, uh, I put their gradients. The gradients cannot appear here, right? I, I, I work to first order and gradients, so there is no preferred direction. I cannot write anything new. But what is new if I look at the odd moments of this distribution? If I look at the odd moments, um, they normally zero. And now I see that my jet is distorted. So I can calculate it. It's a model calculation. I will have to compare essentially this Q-hat with this thingy. But I do see that my jet is banded by the gradients. Again, at this level, it's a broadening calculation. So it's more like an ensemble of partons is banded. But perturbatively, people start with few partons and they talk about jets. It's very hard to discuss, to, to go much further with um, part and shower inside matter. So that's how it goes. It goes per torrent. Now, if I do for the flow, if I go for the flow, I will turn off anisotropy. I will put the velocity back. I will try to resum the same ladder diagram. It will get hard. And it will get hard because of um, flow unavoidably appears uh, at 1 over e. The non-trivial effect of flow appears at 1 no, over e order. Actually, one remark which i for forgotten to make and which is important. Um, you, you one may wonder why I just don't boost the final answer. Why I do, do why do I talk uh, about some local flow if I, can, I have like some amplitude calculated before with no flow? Why I just don't boost it? And the answer is simple. The energy expansion is not commuting with general boosts. All these results, even for the simplest processes, they compute it in the limit of large energy. So you cannot just boost. Um, and even if you go to some fixed order in one over E, you cannot boost. You need to know the answer to all orders in E. So I work to the leading one over E order. I keep the leading flow effects. And what I fly, find is similar. This is the, in some way, answer to my first question. Jets do feel the flow and the gradients, the matter, the hydrodynamic matter evolution. They get blown away. Sorry, can uh, you but, just can you just describe a little bit the letters in that formula? What is chi? What is mu? Yeah, and in this thing, okay, sure. Yeah, chi is uh, it was few flies back. It's called opacity. Let's go back and look at it. It's very useful. It's called opacity. It's common common object in this business. Um, it's the perturbative parameter controlling the story. So it's has uh, it has alpha alpha squared, right? Then some color factor, and then 
uh, competition between density of the solar seas, the size of the matter or path of your of your pattern, and the Debye mass. It tells you that if even if your coupling is slightly large, but matter is very diluted, you still can do some things perturbative. If your matter is too large, you may face issues, and then you cannot expand in this thing. And essentially, the whole community is divided into two groups. Uh, people who resummon chi, those people usually solve these complicated path integrals, which I was show, show, uh, showing. These path integrals are not that hard uh, for a series, but as soon as you start putting their evolving parameters, like rho, depending on the path, you have some complications. Uh, and they have uh, particular assumptions on their calculations because otherwise they cannot read pass integrals. And there are people who work into leading order in the sky. Those people are much more flexible in the assumptions, but they cannot uh, consider bigger, met, ma, ma, bigger, bigger media. So their medium always assumed to small to be small enough. Um, it's called opposite expansion or GLE. Um, so now this opacity appears here. Okay, let's go here. Is this opacity? This object is exact, okay? It just happens that this particular moment is linear and chi. Then it has velocity. On general grounds, it's just the bending that the flow blows my jet away. And this part is the result of the integration of the in medium potentials. So I have to put some cutoff. It's regulated, it's my UV cutoff. In infrared, I'm regulated by the biomass, but in UV, I should be regulated by something. Uh, and the idea always is that I want to calculate um, some absorbable like Q hat, and then uh, use Q hat to define the cutoff at the end of the day. So that's essentially what people do in FAM. Uh, but for the moment, I calculate them in the same fr framework with the same cutoff, and then I will uh, figure, I mean, I assume that this log will be figured out by comparing um, to this guy. Okay. But you are doing perturbation theory in Kai, or you said some words about Kai being. Oh, here, here I some. Here I summon chi, uh, all these letter diagrams I are summed. I still can do that. Ah, because this, uh, your quantity, so, sorry, but if you resum, why don't you get higher powers of chi? Is it well, because... it has, well, it just, it just, that's what I just said. This particular object happens. It's an emergent behavior of this particular average. So generally, if you write p pi cube, there will be all kinds of powers of chi entering. Okay? Ah, it just for yeah. averaged p, it happens to have linear term. It's, I mean, again, it's like some given moment of the given of very particular distribution. So many simple things can happen. Um, now, to talk about more uh, like about jets more like in a vacuum. So to do a jet, not just a pattern, people usually want to go and look at radiation, and it's much much more complicated than what I was showing you. Uh, but it's still feasible as long as you do that perturbatively. So you look at one. Actually, the funny statement is that people did one emission 20 plus years ago, uh, and two emissions are not done until now. So full uh, calculation and such effective theory for two emissions is not uh, obtained, has not been obtained. It's uh, getting unaccessibly complicated very quickly. Not even, not even in the case of um, uh, recent interactions, even when I expanded the number of interactions. The full answer for two emissions is not known. Uh, but it's, use... a, it's a, a computational problem or a, there is a conceptual obstacle? I mean... No, it's, it's, it's like, it's a computational problem in, in many body field theory, if you wish. It's, uh, it's just that when you start calculating these objects, there are many, many, many diagrams. You can get most of them and then trying to just Come, write the final answer, you get like some hundreds of terms and then averaging them. You cannot just rely on, on, on the regular approach to uh, higher loop calculations, which are very developed, I say, in amplitudes. You have very different type of field theory and it's just not developed here. So people cannot put it in some mathematic code and get the answer. So there are several people who are trying to do it, but it's like, you know, usually, say, Peter Arnold, he's a senior guy who is working uh, he, who, who has permanent position so he can has luxury to work on something for a long, long time. So the, most of the answers for two emissions are coming from him. Okay, now I will try to do that for one emission with gradients. Uh, actually, I did it, okay? I, I will try to show. <laughs> um, and so my, my as I was initial direction of jet, that is 
gradient, so my jet is slightly bended. This is the angle with the gradient, and then it will emit gluon. And I want to know what happens with this gluon, both because of it will do the same thing as a this parton. It will also get bended by temperature as an independent parton, but also the emission itself may get slightly modified. And fortunately, this machine is developed enough and it's uh, sufficiently robust. So all the gradients, they start entering only at the averaging level. So this formula would be the same uh, as what people will write with no gradients. And uh, the gradient corrections will sit inside these blobs. That formula is valid only for small energy of the emitted gluons. Uh, because if the energy is not small, you will have average of many propagators together, not two point objects, but like four and six point objects. And those are not solved, okay, even numerically. Uh, so in the small X limit, in the small energy of the emitted gluons, uh, this guy is already obtained. It's just the broadening from before. And this guy is something called emission kernel. You can do it perturbatively. It's some, not that simple, but feasible mass integral. You can do it. And then uh, threading it through some simple numerical simulation, you can, this calculation is analytic, just the last integrals are such that you cannot take them. So it's uh, useless to show them. Um, but if you put them, their numbers, you will see the following. So when you look transverse to gradients or at zero gradients, you get some spectra of your gluons emitted in the final state. I forgot about the uh, daughter, daughter quarks. I integrated them out. Um, I get the same curves as usual. And now there is a difference if I look along, along gradients and against gradients, and the gluons preferably emitted against the gradients. This, this bit is the matter bit, so it can actually go negative. This bit is telling you how matter redistributes gluons in the radiation. Looking at this spectra is not very helpful because if unless you were doing uh, uh, some uh, heavy ion phenomenology, you probably wouldn't recognize them. But you can look at something simpler, analogous to what I was doing before. Uh, and here is the trans average transverse momentum in the given energy bin of my emitted gluons. And the three, three curves are for different definitions of uh, what stays within my jet and what goes out. So you see the, the gluons emitted within the jet, uh, staying within the jet, they on average want to have kick against the gradients. Now I see that my uh, pattern inside the jet is also bended. Um, by the way, the flow bit of the same type of radiation is not done. It's, uh, it's much more complicated and we are working on it. Um, I hope it will be done. But now let's do a very quick estimate of what it matters, like whether it matters for, you know, phenomenology or not. Um, I more, as I said, I'm more interested in the theory here, but still uh, since the field is phenomenology driven, it's important. So I will look at the deflection of an angle of say single part of this broadening effect. And what I will find looks very uh, pessimistic. I find that one degree deflection will mean that uh, my jet should have like 50 GV energy, which is a bit low even for uh, rig. And then one degree deflection is uh, something experimentalists probably wouldn't be able to see. If you talk with them, they will say, oh, 10 degree deflection is something potentially feasible if you get a smart observable. However, you immediately should recall that like all these jets are made of many particles. So quickly after the initial moment, they become uh, like you know, a collection of particles and those particles have low energy. In fact, if, if I plug their 10 GV, which is still large, Usually they have few GVs. It will be already 15 degree deflection. So I do expect that the substructure of my partners will be hugely modified. Uh, and then uh, looking into that, we did some simulations and uh, looked into the energy distribution within the cone in a very simplistic setup. Like when I have gra gradient tra just transverse to my uh, jet axis. You see, I have like a little bit more energy going here than here. So my jet is deformed. And then I can try to shredder it through some observable. And that's what I was promising uh, like you know, some slides ago that I will try to look at uh, energy energy correlators. The main issue in this business is that when you want to replace this D sigma by the calculations inside metric, you need to make some assumptions. You either need to take very simplistic model for this guy, which is not calculated, but just deduced, or you need to go beyond uh, well beyond what people can calculate because of uh, in the recent case, which is um, now dominating the phenomenology, 
um, this guy is known only for small x, right? And when I actually it should be x, so it should be x. We're integrating by x from zero to one in something expanded in smallness of x is not a very good idea. Uh, however, if you do that as a just test, you will see that the answer start uh, splitting, but for like in reality, you either have to go to smaller media and expand an opacity, where it's reasonable to expand an opacity, or go and do much more complicated exercise trying to go beyond the small x. In these things, there are recent results for that, but those are not taking into account anything. They are in the most simple bricks because it's very complicated to go there. However, it's promising, meaning like if you go to experiment, you do expect to see these effects. So now it's a question whether you can calculate them, but as a motivation for experiments to look, to look into that, it's good. However, just to close this discussion, let me show you something else because of things from before look like it's always some energy suppressed thing. So it's something small, some small correction to what people do. But now in my recent work with um, uh, my younger collaborators, um, what I what we what, what we try to do, we try to look at the flowing and uh, structured matter. So this is transverse direction, it's two-dimensional. This line is two-dimensional. So you can think about two-dimensional. Jet goes this way and this is time. So while jet goes from some point to some point, the matter moved. So you see another position inside matter. Then matter moved more and you see another position. If matter structured, that would change local properties. So what you find, uh, here I made some very, very crude assumption about how the properties of matter change. Say so flow is constant, despite that I can, in principle, have all the possible hydro gradients uh, there in the in this work that is general answer but just to illustrate i assume that only the density of my sources change over the path of the jet and inside the matter so what happens is um, there is this correction which mixes the transverse flow with transverse gradients uh, i wrote in this way because of this thing is a order one okay I, the, the speed of uh, quark gluon plasma can be close to, to like no, for sure one half of speed of light actually larger if you look at hydro simulations the gradients shouldn't be too small, otherwise you will have no change within your plasma. At least the temperature should go from something to zero to going to the edge of plasma. And then the, this combination of the pass and temperature, it should be, it cannot be small because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do hydro. You should have to assume that your thermal system is of the size at least several one over temperature. So this actually can be large. So this quantity is of order one. It has no energy suppression. Suppression is in principle, it can compete with this thing. I can prove that it's never getting it negative, but it, it, it will compete. And so it's of order one correction. And now this Q hat by itself defines all the existing simulations of um, um, jets in quark gluon plasma. That's why in principle, this is a very important effect which should be embedded into all the simulations. And if you do that for radiation, the effect is also huge. It can change the spectrum like by a factor of two, even for very small gradients. Okay. Now, just to summarize, move this thing here. So the partons do feel the flow and, uh, and anisotropy, so they get blown away. Uh, the substructure changes and changes even more. So the, if we're going to look for these effects and try to do any jet tomography ever, it's a question about substructure. Um, the, some of these effects are, are even more sizable and they appear in uh, limit of infinite energy of leading parton, the, the most standard limit people use. So all the simulations in principle should be reconsidered if you want to take um, the real evolution into account, not just plug there, the, you know, not just assume that you can do ideal hydro for these objects. Um, these things can be probed in experiment. Uh, it's hard to come up with good observable. Usually experimenters really don't like to go to differential because it's very hard for them. But uh, it's clearly at the edge of feasibility. So you can try to, st you, you already can start doing that. And then in the next 10 years, they will be improving accuracy of all these uh, experiments. And uh, finally, uh, surprisingly to me, because I was coming from different um, subfield of heavy ion collisions, uh, it happens that most of the other probes, if you will think about quarconium or about so-called heavy flavor observables, they describe within the same or very similar formalism. So all the results obtained here, they just illustrate that you can plug now to all the hard props. And then moreover, why I said that it's very simplistic, but people doing calculations for cold nuclear matter, where seemingly you should use just real QCD, for energy laws, they still use the same calculations. It's just they say that the fluctuations are now quantum and the 
uh, screening lengths is uh, lambda QCD and not some DBI mass. Uh, unfortunately, there is no QCD calculation for energy loss, which I would love to do eventually. Uh, and most of the considerations for cold nuclear matter, for DIS-like experiments, uh, more, most of such calculations are done with the same formula. So you can immediately go there at the their level of accuracy and try to couple to structure of uh, cold nuclear matter. So it goes uh, definitely useful for AIC, but you can go back to uh, Hare and Hermes. Now, what I'm going to do next, I want to complete this digital tomography toolkit, at least on the theory side. I want to start developing the proper energy loss formalism in cold nuclear matter, starting from QCD, something along lines of um, very old works on twist expansion. So people managed to show that you can do twist expansion and capture some of these effects, but those were largely motivated by this formalism. So it's not truly QCD calculation. So I want to go in, the, in and formalize them. Um, you can try to go deeper into weakly strongly coupled regimes. And that's what I was doing years before, uh, before I started doing perturbative jets. So I would like to compare some of these directional effects in um, uh, holographic models for jets because of the people in FENO actually using some of holographic models. It would be interesting to see how of this how some of these effects appear there. Um, also, it's probably oversimplified. I mean, like for, the normal holography is not very well suited for these calculations, but well, um, all that can be applied to different probes and different forms of matter. Uh, and then ideally in collaboration with, uh, with with some people with whom we are discussing these things now, I want to implement, the, I want to see the theory implemented, not that I going to put, to do that myself, uh, at least not immediately. Uh, I want to see that implemented to engineering it, to something people actually use to do phenomenology. Um, so jets do get bended by the flow, which is very nice. You do see that the wind blows away your jet. Um, I would love to see that implemented in future series um, and this series should be developed. And a part of uh, doing jets, I'm doing many different things. Um, and uh, just to mention for you to have it uh, here right away. So I was working on the realization of QFT anomalies in many body systems. So it's all the anomalous story. All, it is a story about the anomalous transport, all these chiral effects, which are very general appearing in different systems. So it's a very cross-field thing from wild cinematos to early primordial plasma. I'm interested in spin dynamics and QCD matter, uh, both at the QCD level, meaning like in cold nuclear matter at the level of PDFs and GPDs and in the um, hydro. I'm interested in holographic plasmas because holography is a perfect playground to look at the sum of transport phenomena where you can capture the microscopics uh, without, you know, in the same framework where you do the hydro itself is very nice. I was doing some simple calculations and I want to deepen a little bit in hydro EFTs. Um, there are very nice questions there about anomalies and uh, it's a good starting point where you can enter. I recently finished uh, several works on uh, condensed matter applications of my um, uh, of my results in uh, many body anomalies. Um, and one of them uh, is just uh, accepted to Fizzer of B and should appear there soon. It's on collective action and wild semi-metals. The idea is that uh, the anomaly has infrared pole if you look at the triangle diagram. And then for condensed matter people, this pole will immediately mean in collective mode and in our field somehow people usually disregard that fact. They say, oh, it's some artifact. Um, and then when you start uh, digging there in many body systems, you see that this pollen did mixes with uh, the sound of your of your many body system at the low energy, uh, the low energy limit, and the the anomalous bit of EFT gives you a collective mode with axionic coupling to electromagnetism, and it indicates that some files and metals may may have axionic modes, and people in kind of matter actually searching for these modes right now, so it's very hot topic. And then I had some ideas on trying to apply a uh, quantum information uh, toolkit here, but unfortunately it fit, uh, this, this uh, subfield of heavy intelligence is somehow oversimplified right now. So what I'm seeing on the market looks like people calling uh, classical current jets, which is a little bit uh, too much. But there are things which can be done there fairly. Um, Again, you can try to look for sure on two-dimensional systems and uh, discuss some things about anomalies. Um, okay, let me stop here. Okay, let's think. So um, I have, a, I guess, a general question. So 
I, maybe I'm trying to summarize too broadly, but it sounds like what you're doing is more like the background and not the QCD. Is that is that an accurate way of saying it? Not necessarily. I have I have formal training in QCD. No, 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 no. no. I, I wasn't clear. The the, the the thing that you were talking about today is yes. trying to understand the background of the can you understand QCD by 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 your by this research, or is it more to understand the background that you have to subtract out in order to see the QCD? No, no, you can you can understand QCD. The, the idea here is somehow um, it's like in small x physics. So quickly, when you go to small x physics, you start wondering what stay stays there out of QCD in these classical condensed gluonic fields. Okay. And people, in principle, uh, manage to relate the, these calculations to PDFs, to non-perturbative part of QCD. So it's the same ideology here, okay? So you want to do this model calculation, but ideally you want to couple it to PDFs if you wish of quark gluon plasma. Okay. It's just this level of what people are discussing, it would be too much for them. So you don't, I mean, I don't show these things. But ideally what you want to do, you want to have generalistic distributions of partons entering into the fields, in the stochastic fields. And okay. then you... So the, you this, this effect that you are looking for, that you think you have found, can be computed in some principle from QCD, you think? Or is it just a hope that... I think you can you, you, you have much more hope to do it in uh, cold nuclear matter, so that's next step. These effects are general, so they are there. It's like, you know, like looking at flow, you know that like if you put, if you put any impurity into water, it will somehow go with flow. Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's liquid, uh, solid. Uh, um, now, in cold nuclear matter, you can try to do the fair calculations, more fair. And that's where I want to make detour now, because if I don't think you can go much further in hot nuclear matter. Okay. And hot nuclear matter is just too complicated system. So you will have to go and re- uh, consider it from the beginning. And I don't think you can quickly go much further than what people have. It took 30 years to go from a brick to at best brick moving in transverse direction. I understand. But you started, you didn't start from hydrodynamics, right? I don't know your, how did uh, you get the area? So I, I, I didn't do hydro as hydro simulations. What I did was my first paper in like, in the master, okay, I had some detour to field theory and gravity uh, before, but my first paper in master was on uh, hi anomalous hydrodynamics. Okay. Right. So Sounds it's good. analytic hydro. It's analytic hydro. So that's that's why I often refer to hydro. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Another question? Yeah, I have a question, and uh, uh, more or less in the same direction, like uh, like Nathan. So if I understand well this business of jets and what you have been doing, is is it closely tied to experiments, right? To explain what we see in this very complex heavy ion event and explain, say, how hadrons are emitted and things like that. Now, can you put your hands in some microscopic feature of QCD by just looking at your your theory where exactly enters some features of QCD, say fragmentation, confinement, and and, and... so 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 for, for, okay so fragmentation yeah. enters one shell and they are asymptotic and and all this business yeah. how exactly or this is not the aim of the game I mean it's I mean ideally it is the, the aim. The problem when you come to this field, you figure out immediately that the theory is so simplistic that you should first uh, make some steps ahead. So the pra practical problem is that most of the things you are describing are out of reach at the moment. So you can access the real QCD looking at this small V at the potential of gluons, which should control these observables. However, as I told you, this uh, model is... Uh, it's at the edge of applicability of this model to look into this object. Uh, but it's there. Now, fragmentation has different problem. You can, you can do fragmentation on vacuum, but there is no real-time uh, fragmentation picture. Fragmentation is always in some uh, momentum space, right? So it's living in different space from real time. And matter living in real time 
So one of the things we were discussing for a long time with some of my theoretical collaborators is to think about fragmentation in real time. But it's something not existing even in a vacuum. So I do think what we are doing will be useful for capturing, say, for, for imp, imp, implementing real fragmentation into jet physics. But it will require, you know, that, that I can easy, easily forget about all my matter effects, at least for the moment, put it aside and say that all this jet theory is not good enough and start over. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, I got, I got you. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, it's eventually what I want to do too. Yeah. And uh, how much you rely on on the existence of, let's say, the concept of a temperature or, or of a local equilibrium and all that? Suppose that is completely wrong. Uh, what will stand up in your thing? I I really I really like the question. Actually, that's something I'm trying to do. So I'm trying to digress now deeper to the more proper uh, QCD method. And we are trying to look now, instead of plugging there these guys moving with some constant velocity, pu putting there some real stochastic distribution of the partons. That's what we are doing with some guys doing initial stage for the theory of initial stage for uh, covariance, for Higg. But uh, I think it will stand still there. It will still work. It will still work. Uh, but to have such theoretical development in this field, you need to uh, see whether there is any imprint out of non-equilibrium distributions of partons in the final state. And I'm sure there is. But the question is to find the right ones, to at least something which will be plausible for the field. So that's uh, the short-term goal. I think this paper actually half written, so soon I will have just a non-equilibrium matter. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ricardo, you have a question? Yeah, maybe it's a naive question, but I don't know. You might be aware about uh, what is called non relativistic QCD or heavy quark effective theory. So, has anything to tell you? I mean, to, for uh, your applications? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, we were, look, so the, the, these people doing heavy quark, they, Ignore some of the matter effects. So mm -hmm. there are several things. So educatively, I want to see havoc works uh, re calculated in this BDMPS Z style formulas. People didn't do mm -hmm. it, it's just educative exercise, but it will be very nice to see it. Um, but then for many of the applications, what people were doing, they use uh, so called open quantum mm -hmm. systems. Now it's uh, a very, very popular approach to uh, quarkonium. They get coefficients out of uh, non-relativistic QCD, uh, and then they look at some kinetic equations for them. And we actually recently touched that because of there is literally the same description for uh, broadening, for part and broadening. So I think at least um, gradient effects can be implemented in quarkonium description at the same level of accuracy. And again, I mean. I think it's little the theory there is a little bit better, but it still has struggles from all the same questions. How close it's to real QCD as soon as you discuss it inside that. Okay. So you mentioned a few times that uh, the field is very experimental, uh, experimentally driven, and that uh, you would probably prefer to to do some theory that the experimentalists would not care. So if if it was not for experiment, what kind of theory do you think it's interesting and worth exploring? Because so you, you, see, you, 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 you see, it's, it's, it's always very hard, right? Because if usually either aim at something, right? Or you just follow interesting questions appearing here and there. So I was quite excited about uh, jets in evolving matter just because of, I figured out that the theory is so simple that you can calculate so many things well beyond what people do. You cannot improve the theory itself quickly. Uh, but what I want to explore um, in the longer term, I on the, it, it depends on at, at what level you, you, you're asking. Do you at very formal or less formal? Meaning, do you, do, do you are you asking about very formal theory? Then I'm probably more interested in uh, say hydro EFTs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And hydro EFTs and general effective field theory a toolkit. 
Uh, if you're asking about more uh, about theory, but which has uh, reached to um, experiments, at least some reach, I'm interested in uh, I'm interested in uh, these kinds of many body calculations and applications of effective tools, um, mainly to um, different types of uh, liquids and plasmas, right? So there are things in condensed matter which I want to do, but those are just a playground because of there you can do relativistic quantum field theory on the you know on the top of this table. Uh, but out of the standard things is uh, cold nuclear matter. This is probably the closest thing I'm going to do. Hot nuclear matter, I'll just continue what I'm doing and see what, where, whether it reaches any tests. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do was in uh, environments with neutrinos. So I wanted to look at some flavor effects and kinetic theory of neutrinos because of in these anomalous dynamics, there are many discussions of um, peculiar top uh, topology-driven effects in kinetic theory. And the flavor bit is completely unexplored. That's something I wanted to do for a long time. Um, I guess for you know next five, uh, ten years, it's uh, more than enough to explore. So uh, in the fluid stuff, the more formal stuff, so that, of course, there are many people doing fluids and effective field theory. Uh, what exactly do you think um, you would like to explore that is not done? So first, the edge is now at MHD, right? So there is no effective field theory for MHD. Okay, there are suggestions. For what? Sorry, for what? Magnetohydrodynamics. So magnetohydrodynamics, MHD. So there okay. are recent works on all of these one forms formalisms for magnetohydrodynamics and some restrictive regimes. And it's interesting to see where it goes. Uh, there are ways, first, I mean, since I'm coming from that bit, I'm curious what happens with anomalies in this series because of uh, working with uh, all this chiral media, we got interested in the question of what happens with so-called microscopic helicities. It's linkage of flow and magnetic field lines. These quantities are either conserved or semi-conserved in MHD, so now they should do something interesting in these EFTs. So I think it's going to be the entry point for me there. The other question is that there are different old, very old approach to effective field theory for hydro, which is different from modern one. And it's very interesting to see where they diverge from each other. So for instance, the people uh, we are doing hydro with Klebsch potentials for decades until the recent moves with these um, target coordinates. So it's very interesting to see how, how far I can go uh, with scratch potentials. There are some interesting claims about that you cannot put some of the anomalies in this theory. I never seen it uh, you know, proven or shown. So this, I guess, good entry points. But generally, I mean, it's, it's usually with, uh, with any effective field series, you want to have some uh, generic statement uh, about uh, where series can end up in the classification of them, right? So, yes, just very quickly. so are you saying that for usual fluids, we know how to add viscosities, et cetera, and parameterize the low energy expansion, but for magnetohydrodynamics, the same analysis is not done and people don't know how to describe fluids with the... The, 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 big, the bigger issue is not the, I mean, okay. They, they, at the level you are talking, they know, but now, now a question, can you write an action principle for such system? Which is usually needed when you want to go to fluctuations and discuss it some as many many body system. Um, so with the dissipation. action, yeah, with dissipation. People people know how to write the effective action for the usual hydro with dissipation, and they now know how to write it for MHD in some restrictive regions. Is that, is that the challenge because of dissipation? So you have to somehow couple it to something, or I, I think generally it's very hard to write uh, action effective action for hydro. It's generally not, not, not simple question because we need to identify physical degrees of freedom somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what what would be the very variational principle in this business? So people were thinking, trying, found some options, and then they found that some options are better than the others. Mm -hmm. That's on the very formal side. That's one of the things I want to explore. Phil. But I'd like to always balance between 
very formal things and uh, something which can be useful on the physics side. So. Cool, thank you. At some point, I think you mentioned holography. Is this useful for anything in related to jets or something like that? Or... I mean, sure, 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 in some way. So I like holography more because if you can do uh, microscopics, hydro, like you know, when you do hydro, you have coefficients which you cannot calculate without going to some microscopic theory. Holography is nice because of giving you hydro along with these coefficients right away in the same formula as just wrapped all together. So looking at some types of transport when they are, you know, unique examples, like say, like at chiral effects, is very nice in holography. Now, people did something for jets and holography. This is much more um, speculative because of it's fan driven, right? You not only uh, like you know, modifying your ideas for uh, with something to make it uh, to to get jets, right? The N four doesn't have jets, right? You want to put there something. You put there some strings and look where they go. Uh, but then you also have issues with interpretation because of in reality, uh, you know that jets have the, um, the pattern shower. And the, and the picture which you get in holography is very, very far. So you can fake a jet, but the question was it's uh, anything close to jet is, I don't see how to answer it easily without having you know real dual to QCD and looking at real at something, some real correlate, right? Um, however, yeah, there are questions people use. There is so-called hybrid model where, where people really to, to, uh, they took energy loss from holography and then you know, and put it into some simulations for energy loss in heavy ions. Okay, so they put take jets and each part is losing energy according to some holographic formula. Um, and they describe observables, but the question is how many parameters they have, right? So it's, it's usually if you have 20 free parameters, you can write a question of state of an elephant. Um, on the other hand, some of these questions curious generally. Especially when you don't talk about jets, but talk about single part, and there you have some control. For instance, jet quenching parameter was calculated in holography, uh, and this calculation looks much more meaningful than calculation for because it's single part and calculation calculation for and for diffusion of endpoint of string. Um, this kind of calculations, I think you can probe some of the ethics I'm discussing this way, and then compare them with PQCD calculation. That's something I think I want to do. For instance, gradient corrections to QCAT. Like that. During your talk, you mentioned <clears throat> that some of the questions are, uh, as you said before, are irre irrelevant because experimentalists, uh, let's say, cannot see anything uh, about that. Do you think? This could change in the near future. I mean, there might be, let's say, experimental, uh, let's say, achievements that make some of these questions uh, or some of these points relevant for them, or no? Yeah, yeah. You see, you, do, do you want my optimistic or pessimistic answer? Optimistic, yes, I think. But are they going to improve accuracy of all the measurements? So if they, so eventually they, they are now finishing all the simple measurements. So if you ask experimental, they're actually wondering what to measure next. So they are ready to make some, you know, some next step to more differential objects. And then you probably can access some of the of these uh, uh, features, which are now assumed to be not important or like, you know, going mm -hmm. well beyond what can be seen. So that uh, could be the, that could give a boost, I think, to, let's say, your investigation, right? Because you will have immediately new relevant questions just because the experiments. Yes, yes, yes. Right now, what we are trying to convince them, and I think they have some interest in that, to look at uh, anisotropic harmonics, azimuthal anisotropic harmonics within the jet. Mm -hmm. Something like what people do for hydro in heavy ion collisions, but within the jet. And there are many reasons to do that, because if people actually see some, okay, at least they claim to see indications of some anisotropy even in vacuum within the jet. So there are some recent works where people discuss, is there... QGP-like state within the jet and PP collisions. Mm -hmm. So there is interest in looking at anisotropy within the jet. And some of these calculations first may bring back to real QCD, which would be very nice. Uh, and on the other hand, they clearly connect to all this uh, coupling to hydro with jets. Mm -hmm. 
So I think, I, I, I think yeah, it will be improving. But on the other hand, on the pessimistic side, I don't think uh, anything will change unless there is uh, real-time part on show. Because without real part, uh, real time part on show, you cannot do, uh, you cannot do jets, uh, you know, fairly with the background, and that's I mean, a very long-standing problem. So I don't know whether it's uh, feasible to solve. It's something I want to look at, but you know, it's like saying I want to solve confinement. It's I want, but it's not, doesn't matter that I, 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 I that doesn't mean I can <laughs> immediately at least. Um, So in in Lisbon, you are uh, within a group of experimental with experimentalists, right? And uh, no, no, in Lisbon there is fan group. Fan there is very small. There is very small fan group, uh, and I am part of that group. So, but in in principle, in Lisbon, I am uh, I am somehow on my on my own, right? So I got some local uh, governmental money for uh, my project, which uh -huh. was uh, written around fan of uh, quaternion plasma and threads there. Uh, so. There's a guy, there are a few people doing jets there, uh, mainly two. One of them is my co-officer already. Uh, with Eliana, we didn't write anything together, but we know each other, each other very well. But we somehow, I'm not necessarily going in the same direction because of these guys, they are more focused on real fan of heavy ions. Um, uh -huh. Meaning Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo style calculation. When you do simulations for part and shower, you make some crude assumptions about what happens in matter, and then you do vacuum part and shower on, and plug there some matter effects a posteriori somehow. Mm -hmm. I see. So how important is it for you to be close to phenomenologists or close to experimentalists? Mm, no, I don't think it's important. As I told you, I, I came to this business because of, I realized that this, in the, First, I wanted to answer whether just feel the flow because if I saw that, I know heavy quarks and holography do feel the flow. So I, uh, I, when I came to Lanel with uh, their fellowship, uh, there were no very formal theories in, in heavy ions. They were more phenological people. And talking to them, I realized that their theory is very simplistic. It it sounded almost like I didn't understand something. When then I digged in, I figured out that they, at this level, they're working at this level, I decided I can easily put there something. And I got a lot of support from that side. So I got uh, like three jobs through that, right? So uh, it was clearly, there, there was some clear uh, community push to, for me to continue doing that. But it's not like I'm going to do uh, medium coupling of uh, to, uh, or, or jet, medium, medium induced effects and jets for the rest of my life, right? So I'm slowly wrapping up these things and I'm going to next things soon. Thank you. Any other questions from people? Uh, my, my very stupid question. Who drew the first pictures, the beautiful pictures of the... Did you draw them? The, this ones with the, the media? And... I have huge advantage. I have huge advantage. My wife is graphic designer. Uh, she, did, uh, she, draw the, she drew the pictures? Yeah. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah, I could tell that they were. Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but periodically, <laughs> periodically, I have a uh, luxury of coming and saying, I need a new picture for presentation. Nice. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. So I, I have a question, uh, Andre, about your work, uh, current work. Um, so jet quenching has been observed. Is that correct? Yes, by, people do see that there are pairs of jets, and one is uh, support, right. surprising. And, and there is, and there, there is some theoretical models comparing the observed things with a QCD. Is that correct? Oh, per, 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 perfect question. It depends on how you say it. Yes, it's correct, but then the issue is that immediately in any QCD motivated calculation, you have some parameters which you are not controlling. And that's it, right? So period. From that moment, you cannot say you calculated jet quenching and uh, compared to predicted thing. So what people usually do, they calculate suppression of energetic part and say RAA. They calculate it and there are some cutoffs which they don't control at all. So now they fix these cutoffs to match date. 
there is some dependence on energy of the partners, on PT of partners. And after they fix it for one PT, they look whether their curve is uh, close to experiment. So in this sense, it depends on whether curve is good enough to compare or not, right? So these calculations, they do not take into account the flow. No, sure not. And what you're saying is that um, if you take into account the flow, oh, first of all, the first question is, is there a way of this in these very simplistic calculations with the cut, et cetera, to take into account the flow? Yes, because of all the things I did, they have they are essentially in probe limits. So you can take somebody doing uh, hydro simulations and just ask them to give you flow. Essentially, they, you can ask them to run one more formula along with their code, taking the numerical integrals because for them it's very easy. And then they will produce you some answer um, immediately. Or you can do it yourself. Actually, I have collaborators who try to do that. And then you can look at all kinds of anisotropic effects, meaning like they have the end of uh, energetic particles. Right, so, so sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but this seems to be almost straightforward. Has this been done? People started doing that. There are some works, but still not in most sophisticated models. Because of you see, it's yeah. like with experimentalists now, simulations are done by groups of dozens of people. And they have requests from experimental guys, like we need that, that, that by then. Uh, and then you come to them and say, guys, can you quickly simulate for me? And they're not much interested, right? Because of they uh, they fishing for different things. So you can do either simple simulations yourself or try to convince the same people to do serious simulation with what you have. And slowly it's coming. So I see more and more people doing simulations, referring to my work, saying that, okay, they wish to do that. But so far it's mainly, we wish to do that in the future. It's not like yet we have done that. Mm -hmm. One of my collaborators did simplest simulation. Uh, he was aiming to calculate uh, anisotropic coefficients for energetic particles, VN. It's like, you instead of calculating RAA, you want to look how RAA changes in space. And he did this calculation, and he did plug their actual, actual hydro inside. Uh, but it's still toy model level, because if it's not... But is it promising? I mean, does it fit yeah, better yeah. the data or something? Yeah, I mean, it's, you, it's, you see, the problem is that for most, for, for most observables people have, they know that there are different contributions. So at best you can say, look, I have contribution to that. You cannot say I got the right value. For most of the business with hard props, you'd never calculate the exact value of something. So I mean, one, one last question. So you, you draw the flow in, in different ways. So one was the flow going this way and the particle going this way. Yeah. But I would think that uh, since you're colliding, uh, protons with nuclei, you would have something like this, right? So the flow, you also had this no. picture. So can no, you... No, no. Yeah, no, no, the, the point is when you collide them, they're usually produced somewhere here. The, you see the guys flying either up or down, right? At the mid rapidity. And the matter is doing something around, usually flowing either of the ways. Now, what you are saying is that there would be longitudinal flow along the jet path. But that one is easier to take because of longitudinal momentum of jet is large, so you allow it to boost. For that component, you can you can account easier. But it would, doesn't lead to interesting anisotropies you can measure because of those are end up into rapidity direction, and you right. have like small detector, right? You have everything around and a little bit in this direction. Yes. Um, but I, yeah. I mean, we, we for sure can we, we sure can do it, but just didn't try. Somehow, and because of, again, it's it's not like that I'm calculating the observables, right? So it's, yeah. for me, it's an interesting question to put there as an effect. Now I need to find people who would be willing to do the fender for me. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Andre? Okay. Okay, so thanks very much, Andre. So probably within a week, we'll be in touch. Uh, so we're interviewing a few people and then we're gonna let you know. So thanks okay. very much. Nice. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.